Welcome back. This is the learning module for information processing. We're going to do this in two mini lectures. This is the first mini lecture. Here's a few reminders for you. If you're following along, you should be reading chapter seven on information processing. Two, we are about a third of the way through the course, maybe slightly over a third. And we've gone through our first midterm your grades and uh, for the midterm and for all the quizzes, writing assignments and discussion board participation are all on Blackboard. And I've added a new tab called My Grades to make all that information easier for you to see. So go check that out. Also, I've been following along with your conversations in the discussion boards. I'm really happy with what I'm reading. So continue to uh, make those really insightful posts. I'm looking forward to reading what you have to say about the content in this course. All right, uh, we're going to talk about four things in this set of two mini lectures. And this part will cover the first two here, revolutions and metaphors and donders and processing stages. One of the goals of this course is to introduce you to explanations about cognitive processing and cognitive phenomena. And if we take a look at explanations in cognitive psychology, we'll often see metaphors being used as aids for ex explanation. And so we'll see many examples of what I'll call metaphorical explanation. And in a metaphor, what happens is we use the structure and function of one thing to roughly describe another thing. So for example, in this little picture here, I've got a person and inside of their head, what do we have? We don't have a brain in there, but we see a kind of factory with spinning gears and wheels. And in this lecture, we'll see how uh, actually factories or things inside factories like assembly lines have been used as a metaphor to explain aspects of cognitive processing. In the textbook, I claim that big metaphors used in cognitive psychology roughly track technological revolutions in society. So for example, if we look at some of these technological revolutions, we can look at the industrial revolution, the technological revolution, and the digital revolution. And if we look at those things that happened in society, we'll also see that explanations about how cognition works tend to adopt metaphors about technology at the time. So for example, and we'll see uh, an example today, we'll go back to the Industrial Revolution. And we'll see that psychologists are proposing uh, ideas roughly similar to what we see inside of a factory. So how do we build cars back back in that time? Well, or other things we would put them in a factory assembly line and uh, at the assembly line chunks across uh, different things are added to a product to, to turn say raw goods from the very beginning into a finished product at the end. I made a little animation for this and this is basically the idea of the information processing metaphor of cognition where we've got an assembly line and I've got raw goods that come in, say, for example, in the form of stimuli that are coming in to your cognitive processing. And once those raw goods are enter your cognition or brain processes, stuff happens and uh, it turns that information into some kind of action or response in the world. So this is a very rough metaphor for the information processing view of cognition. And we'll expand on that in the lecture. We'll also transition from the assembly line metaphor of cognition uh, to what I'll call the telephone network metaphor. And we see this occurring roughly during the time when telephone technology is being developed, which I re I'm referring to here as the technological revolution. So in this time period, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, we see people talking about cognitive processes as if they're like a telephone network. 
Finally, as we move into the digital revolution in society, we see theories of cognition proposing that cognitive processes operate like a computer. And a computer is a pretty advanced information processing machine, I would say. And this metaphor that cognition is like a computer is still very much alive and well today. And it's probably the dominant way of thinking about how cognitive processing works. All right. In the main part of this lecture, we're going to go back in time to the uh, Industrial Revolution, and we're going to look at a few different proposals and focus specifically on Donders, who is a Dutch, psych uh, a Dutch ophthalmologist, and some of the research he did that uh, paved the way for thinking about processing stages, information processing stages in cognition. Let's jump in. We're going to be talking a lot about mental chronometry in this section. And all of that means is using measures of time to make inferences about cognitive processes. For example, here's a question. How fast can a nerve transmit a signal? This is something that people were wondering about in the 1800s and maybe before and maybe after also. But here's two kind of basic possibilities. Perhaps a nerve can transmit a signal infinitely fast. On the other hand, maybe it's limited. Maybe there's certain speeds with which a nerve can transmit a signal. Now, why would people care about this? Well, imagine you're wondering, you know, how does the brain send signals from one neuron, say, to another neuron? How fast can that happen? Is it infinitely fast? Like, can we just think anything we want as fast as we want because our brain has no limitations? Or are these connections, these physical connections, limited by biological and chemical, electrical realities that cause transmission speeds to, to occur uh, with some slower speed than infinity fast? This is a question that von Helmholtz was interested in, and he was one of the first people to measure nerve conduction speeds. For example, he was able to show that the sciatic nerve of a frog had a conduction speed of about uh, 24.6 to 38.4 meters per second. And this is a really interesting finding at the time because it shows that the conduction speed in a nerve is not infinitely fast and it has a particular speed, and you could even try to measure it if you wanted to. So around the same time, contemporary of Helmholtz was Donders here. He was a Dutch ophthalmologist, and he was thinking, wow, I guess the brain has these limitations in how fast it can process information, and he set out to develop behavioral tasks to try to estimate how long uh, different information processing stages might take. So he was interested in measuring how long it took to measure uh, for the brain or cognition to accomplish different kinds of processing tasks. He was relying on some earlier work using reaction time. So it turns out before psychologists were interested in using reaction times to figure out how fast you can do something, these were first being measured in, astro in astronomy. So for example, you'd have an astronomer looking through a telescope and they'd be trying to make a measurement about where a particular celestial body was. And then later on, after it moved a bit in the sky, they would make another note. And they could use the timing of their observations to figure out and predict where different things are going to appear in the sky. However, uh, across different observatories, different observers would make their notes and possibly would introduce a little bit of human error into the timing. So if you think about 
how things might work. If you're looking up in a telescope, light from some distant star is coming down, photons are coming down in through the telescope into your eye. And then uh, your eye has to transduce that light. The electrical signals from the photon need to be passing through nerves, uh, going through your visual processing, uh, visual cortex, going through nerves, endings down into your hand, maybe to cause you to make a little movement to record when something happened. And if different people, if it takes uh, different people, different amounts of time for that light information to pass through your retina down to making a, resp or making a response, then different observers in these different observatories might make, you know, slightly different estimates uh, based on how long it take, took them to register that light response. So people were already measuring, they're trying to get precise measurements of how quickly somebody can respond to something as simple as just whether you can see a light or not. So Donders was working in this background and he started wondering about the time associated with unique stages of mental processing. He wondered if he could measure it systematically by asking people to complete tasks of increasing complexity. So how long will it take you to do something simple? How long will it take you to do something slightly more complicated? Or how long will it take you to do something slightly more complicated than that? That's the basic idea. And he was interested in developing tasks that he could make claims about possible fundamental aspects of cognitive processing. He came up with these three different tasks. So he measured reaction times in what we'll call a simple reaction time task, a go, no go task, and a choice reaction time task. I'm going to show you some examples. And if I can get my act together, I will actually uh, put some links on the learning module so you can go try these tasks yourself. Just a quick note, as we move forward in this course, we're going to be presenting and talking about many more specific cognitive tasks like these three ones. And in my experience, it's I mean, we can try to talk about them like I have in these slides here. For example, this is a little slide. It's going to have me telling you what a simple reaction time task is. So let's try this, but I'm going to point out that there's really no substitute for experience here. So I think it's often really helpful to see what it's like to participate in a task or participate in a task yourself in order to understand really what's happening. Here, so I'm going to try to verbally explain the simple reaction time, go, no, go, and choice reaction time task. So let's see how that goes. And then I'll flip over to a little demo where we can see how it works. So here's the simple reaction time task. It's very simple. <laughs> Participants are looking at a blank screen and you're waiting for a stimulus to appear. And as soon as you see the stimulus, you have to make a response as quickly as you can. We're trying to measure how long it takes you to react to any stimulus. That's the basic definition. A go no, a go, <laughs> no go task is slightly more complicated. In this task, you're possibly looking at a screen and you're waiting for a particular stimulus to appear. So for example, in this little picture, I have a bluish light. If you saw a blue light, that would mean you need to make a response as quickly as you can. And you would only make your response to the, the stimulus designated as the go stimulus. You could also see a different stimulus. So for example, you could see a red light. And if you saw that stimulus, your task would be to withhold a response. So you don't go for that one. This is slightly more complicated than a simple reaction time procedure. Uh, here you need to care what the stimulus is. In the previous procedure, it might not matter what the stimulus is. Any stimulus, you could just respond to it as quickly as you can. Here, you have to recognize or identify that the stimulus is blue before you make your response. 
So Jaunders would say that this task requires stimulus identification, whereas the simple reaction time task might just simply or more simply re reflect what he calls physiological reaction time. The amount of the minimum amount of time that it takes for something like a light to hit your eyeball and then process through to be able to make a response as quickly as possible. He calls that physiological time. The third task is called choice reaction time. And this one is slightly more complicated than a go no go task. Here there are multiple possible stimuli and you have to respond to each stimulus with a unique response. So if you got a blue light, maybe you'd have to make a left hand response. And if you got a red light, you'd have to make a right hand response. So now you have to figure out what you're looking at that requires stimulus identification. And once you know what you're looking at, you have to choose which response you're going to select. And that requires kind of two additional processes um, that, you know, might take you a little bit longer. At least that's what Donders was wondering. As we increase complexity from a simple reaction time to go, no go to choice reaction time, you know, what happens to how fast you can do these tasks? Here's a little picture that describes what Donders was thinking in terms of processing stages, almost like an assembly line. So he's imagining that out in the world, you have a stimulus that can appear that's going to hit a sensory receptor. And then uh, let's think about the stages of processing that might happen before a response can be made. If you don't have to really do anything, maybe there's going to uh, be some time taken for you to, let's call it, physiologically process that s signal. So you have to transduce the light. It has to go work, your, work its way through your visual cortex and trigger some uh, action. And all of those uh, signals need to go through all your nerve endings and and so at the minimum amount of time to make this response could at least be however long it takes to do this box right here. If you have to do something more complicated, such as identifying what stimulus is there and make a decision about whether to respond or whether or not to respond, you might take a little bit of extra time to identify the stimulus that might take uh, the amount of time in this box, which I've called identification time. If you need to identify the stimulus and then figure out what response to make, you might have to take a little bit more time. You might have to take the response selection amount of time. And Anders was thinking that all of these intervening cognitive stages might occur. And he also had a strategy for trying to measure how long each of these stages would take. So that was his big idea. We're going to talk briefly about his logic for figuring out how long each of these processing stages might take. But before we do that, let me give you a quick example of what it could be like to perform an SRT task, a go no go task, or a choice reaction time task. All right, uh, let me get set up and I'll be right back. Okay, here's a simple reaction time test. And the instructions are on each trial, you will be shown an X and press the X key to detect the stimulus. There'll be 10 trials. So let me try to do this. I'm going to get my finger onto the X key and I'm ready to go. My, my whole uh, purpose here is to wait for the X. And as soon as I see it, I'm going to hit that key and I'm going to try to do it as fast as I can every time. Let's go. There we go. So there's a little plus sign that is uh, telling me I'm going to get an X and the X's are coming in at different times. And all I'm doing is just waiting and trying to press that. Oh, I'm a little slow there. So it's pretty simple. Wait for the X. As soon as you see it, you press that button 
and that's a simple reaction time test. All right, the next kind of test is the go no go reaction time test. In the lecture, we talked about having a blue light or a red light. Here we're going to do X or O. So if you see an X, you got to press that button for X on your keyboard as fast as you can. And if you see an O, don't do anything at all. So let me see if I can do this. I'm going to get my finger on that X and I'm going to press it as fast as I can only when I see an X. Oh, I, I almost pressed the X, but I didn't. There we go. There's an X. Oh, tricky. There's the O, not doing anything. But there's the X. We're getting that X as soon as I can. So this is a, a go, no go task. And every once in a while, you'll just you, you try to get that X. Oh, like I just did. I thought it was going to be an X, but I accidentally pressed the button. All right. Slightly more complicated than a simple reaction time test. The last one's the choice reaction time test. Again, we're going to have an X or an O. But this time, if you see an X, press the X key. If you see an O, press the O key. So I'll get my fingers ready. Let's do it. X. O. And, you know, I'm trying to do this as fast as I possibly can. Uh, there it is. Well, I don't think this takes too long. And I think at the end, let's see what happens. It's going to actually show my results. And this is the little demo that I was hoping to be able to present to the class. Oh, I don't see the results here. That's too bad. But if I get the demo ready for the class, uh, you can do this yourself. And how long it took you to do each of those tasks, it will show up. And we're going to be able to look at how many milliseconds it took for you to make this simple reaction time response, how long it took you to make a go no go response, and how long it took you to make either an X or O response in the choice reaction time test. So why would we want to know how long it took you for each of those tests? I've got a cartoon to describe this and we'll switch over to a graph in a moment also. Here's what Donders was thinking. In the simple reaction time test, uh, I'm displaying the components here that would take different amounts of time. And he's going to say that your simple reaction time performance is just how long it takes light to hit your eye and how long it takes light to move through, be, conduct, be transduced, and make a nerve ending fire on your finger. So that's however long that would take. Just FYI, people can press a button in response to a stimulus pretty quickly takes about 150 milliseconds or maybe 100 milliseconds if you're really fast. So not very long. Let's just remember like 150 milliseconds for that. That's super fast. How long will it take to do a go no go task? Well, this might take a little bit longer because instead of just responding as soon as you see an X, you have to make sure that it's an X first. So this task might require a little extra bit of identification time. So maybe instead of taking 150 milliseconds, you're, you're now going to take 250 milliseconds because you have to spend 100 milliseconds identifying whether the X is an X or something else. Finally, how long will it take you to do a choice reaction time task? This one, uh, for following Donder's logic should take just a little bit longer than the go no go task. Here you have to look at the stimulus and figure out if it's an X or an O. And that could take say 100 milliseconds. And once you figure out what it is, you have to decide which button to press. How long does that take? Maybe that takes 100 milliseconds too. So this one should be a little bit longer uh, than the go no go task. I'm going to describe this in terms of a graph pretty quickly. Here's a graph. And I'm going to draw some bars. Uh, let me draw the bars and then we'll get back. 
All right, here's a pretend graph, and we have a serial reaction time performance right here, and I'm drawing your reaction time, and it's pretty small. So let's imagine this is 100 milliseconds, very fast. And your go, no, go response is a little bit slower by about that much. Let's say this is 150. And your choice reaction time performance is even a little bit slower than that by how much? I don't know. Let's say it's 250 up here. So that's 50 and that's 100. If we were to conduct this experiment on the class, we would probably find data something like this, or the pattern should be the same. Depending on how we measure performance, if we measure performance using a keyboard, there can be a little bit of error, but we would probably see something like this. I think when people do these experiments, common this is the pretty the, the very common outcome. So just uh, at face value, this seems pretty straightforward. The simple thing is fast. The more complicated thing gets harder and also slower. So why is this interesting? If we head back to Donder's ideas, he thought he could employ what he calls a subtractive logic to estimate how long individual components take. So for example, if we thought that the go no go task takes, um, let's, let's say 150 milliseconds because it involves two components, physiological time and the time to identify the stimulus, we could try to estimate how long identification time takes by subtracting performance in the more simple task. For example, in the SRT task, where all you have to do is hit a button, uh, Donder suggests suggest this takes the physiological time. That's how long it takes. Now, if we think about this kind of like an algebraic equation, if we uh, had the go no-go time, which was 150 milliseconds, and we had our simple reaction time, which in the previous graph was 100 milliseconds. If we subtract the simple reaction time, so 150 minus 100, what we're going to be left out with is uh, the identification time. And so perhaps it would take, uh, using Donder's logic, we could estimate that the identification time took 50 milliseconds. Similarly, if we wanted to estimate, well, how long does it take to do response selection? We could take the choice reaction time task, which involves physiological time, identification time, plus the response selection time. And if we subtracted, for example, performance on the go, no-go task, which only involves physiological time and identification time, those terms would cancel out. And what we'd be left with is an estimate of response selection time. So if we went back here and uh, looked at this graph, we would say that if somebody's performance on the choice reaction time test was 250 milliseconds, and we know their performance on the go no go test was 150 milliseconds, that's a difference of 100 milliseconds. And we could say that 100 milliseconds was how long it took the person to make a choice between their responses. So that could be a potentially uh, linked to the response selection stage of processing. So remember that Donders was doing his research in the 1870s, uh, well before the computer was invented. And I'm bringing up his research because he was really uh, the person who came up with these notions of processing stages and tried to find a way to measure the time it takes for different stages of processing to occur. Now, this is, again, a hypothesis, the idea that people receive information through their sensory systems and then do stages of processing. It's not necessarily clear that the stages of processing that Donders identified are um, 
necessarily occurring, but it is a convenient way to think about cognitive processing. It also maps on quite closely to the concept of an assembly line, as if cognition is a process of systematically changing different kinds of information along an assembly line. There are conceptual issues with the subtractive logic, so it's possible that different processing stages can occur in parallel at the same time. If you can identify a stimulus and choose how to respond to it at the same time, which could be how people do it, then subtracting those times won't allow you to estimate how long one of them takes. So Donder's subtractive logic works quite well if stages actually occur in a serial manner, but if they don't, then that subtractive logic, you won't be able to use it to estimate the individual time of one of your processing stages. Whoops, I think I forgot to have the issues with subtractive logic slide up here. Um, all right, we're gonna jump in, in time to the 1950s. So we're moving past the behaviorist period and you know people have been doing reaction time studies throughout the 1900s, the early 1900s. But as we move into the 1950s, we see the metaphor for explaining cognitive processes shift from this assembly line metaphor that Donders, I'm crediting Donders with, to a telecommunications metaphor. We're gonna see evidence of that by looking at the PRP effect. This stands for the psychological refractory period. And debate about this effect about explaining why it happens uh, reflects the metaphorical shift. Now we've only got uh, three or four slides left for this part, and uh, the PRP effect, it really kind of sets us up for the next part, where, uh, which is in a different video where we're gonna be talking about information theory and information processing. So what is the PRP effect? I've got a little picture here for you. We'll talk about it. The PRP effect is the finding that responding to a first stimulus can sometimes delay a response to a second stimulus, especially if the stimuli are presented quickly one after the other. So let's see if I can do a little demo here and just talk this out. If I show you an X, Oops, I can't draw. Let me try drawing here. There, uh, nope, there's an X. Okay, so I'm gonna show you an X, boom. And what you have to do is make a response. And then the stimulus goes away and you're just sitting there waiting and you're going to make another response as soon as you see the next X. So you're just getting one X after the other. A stimulus response, stimulus response. Now what happens if I start making the temporal interval between those stimuli shorter and shorter? So I can go X, X really fast. And that means you have to make response to the first one and response to the second one. As we shorten the duration between the stimuli, what we find is that your response to the first stimulus is uh, as expected, but your response to the second stimulus can be delayed. That's the PRP effect. Here's a little picture of it. And what I have uh, up here is a row, a column for stimuli and a column for response. This is a timeline. So imagine you see a first stimulus like an X and it's on the screen, and you're trying to respond to that thing as fast as you can. So it takes you this RT1, this uh, gray amount of time, to make that response. 
And we're not talking about a lot of time here. So you see an X, you make a response. It takes about 200 milliseconds. So this is how long it takes you to make that response. Okay, now imagine you are made your first response, the stimulus goes away, you're just waiting now for the next one. So I have here a long delay. And then what pops up is your second X. And what you do is you make your response. So if we have these long delays between the stimuli, what we typically find is your reaction time to the first stimulus is about the same as the reaction time to the second stimulus. So that's a situation where we would not find the PRP effect. In the second figure, in the sec or on the right side here, I'm, I'm demonstrating what needs to happen to create a PRP effect. So the first part doesn't really change. We, I'm going to show you a stimulus like an X, and then you're going to respond to that as fast as you can. Now, if we make the delay between, um, so here I have it, if we basically, after you make your response, we show you that next stimulus really quickly. So there's a short delay. What we find is that your response to the second stimulus, like I have a darker gray bar here, it's going to take longer. So if the second thing comes right after, it's going to take you longer to respond to it compared to a situation where the second thing comes at some longer delay. And I'm representing that here, that when there's a short delay between the things that you're doing, um, the time it takes you to do the second thing is longer than the first thing. So we've got a, the first thing is less, takes less time than the second thing, or the second thing takes longer than the first thing. So this is called the refractory period. It's almost as if when you do one thing, it takes a little bit of time to recover your ability to do that thing again. So if you're asked to do a second thing while you're in the refractory period, you have to wait until you recover the ability to do that second thing again. As a result, doing it a second time is a little bit longer, takes longer to recover from the refractory period. That's a kind of, well, it's not really an explanation. I'm trying to describe what the effect is. Now, people be measured this many times, and in the 1950s, in cognition journals, uh, a lot of authors were trying to explain, well, why does this happen? Why is your second response a little bit longer if it uh, if the second stimulus happens r very soon after a first stimulus? So here's a couple explanations that Welford put forward, and this is all in the textbook. Maybe there's just some hardwired properties of signaling among nerve fibers that cause this effect. Maybe it has to do with participants' expectations. For example, if you see a stimulus and respond to it and you see another stimulus right away, that could be surprising. You might be like, whoa, that was very fast. And maybe just the fact that you're a little bit surprised makes you take a little bit longer to make the second response. Another idea was that the PRP effect reflects what's called a central mechanism with a single channel of limited capacity. And this actually is a metaphor back to the telephone network concept. We can read about that a little bit here. I'm, I think this is the end, but I'm going to go to one last picture uh, to take us home here. So this is a picture of a telephone operator. And if you think about how these systems work, lots of information can be coming into the telephone network, right? So lots of people might be trying to make calls, and whenever they pick up their phone and place the call, that call gets routed to a central location where a telephone operator would pick up the call and say, hey, 
uh, who are you and how can I place your call? And they would hear the other person say, oh, I'm, I want to place a call to here. And then the operator would plug in the cable to allow the incoming call to go outgoing to the person they're trying to call. Notice that the telephone operator is just one person. They're kind of like a bottleneck here. They're receiving lots of calls all the time, but how many calls can they process at a time? Just one. They take one, one call at a time, and then they hook that call up. So uh, this person could be thought of like a single channel information processor with limited capacity. And these were the uh, metaphors of the day. So we're thinking that maybe cognition uh, has these kinds of bottlenecks as well. Maybe aspects or stages of some cognitive processes act kind of like a telephone network operator and that they can receive a limited amount of information and they can make one or two decisions at a time given that information before they can go on to receive new information and make more decisions about that new information. Okay, this is the end of part one and we'll see you next time for part two on information processing.